Um, hello, um, welcome to the annual BioCT Signature Holiday event. Um, this is the eighth year that we've been doing this. And my name is Dawn Hosevar, President and CEO of BioCT. This very engaging event is normally in person. However, the variant concerns warranted avoiding a large indoor gathering. This year, we are honoring the career of John Soderstrom, whose 20 plus year tenure at Yale's Office of Cooperative Research was instrumental in growing the life science industry we have today. Tonight, we are going to hear from CEOs, developers, VCs, university colleagues, and more, who will share their stories on how John inspired, mentored, encouraged their careers while commercializing many successful companies. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors. Um, this event's event sponsor is Wynn Stanley Enterprises. Our Entrepreneur of the Year Award sponsor is Shipman and Goodwin. Our legacy partners are Boringer Ingelheim, Pfizer, Yukon, and Yale. Our ambassador sponsors are Alexion, Aon, Markham, Strategic Spaces. And our supporter sponsors are Connecticut Innovations, Medtronics, Semaphore, Shipman and Goodwin, and Wigan and Dana. Thank you very much for your sponsorships. We very much appreciate it. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to David Shear, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dawn. Um, it is, uh, this is sort of an important day for me and for the life science community. We have an opportunity to honor one of our own, a person who has contributed measurably to the vibrancy and success of our life science cluster in Connecticut, John Soderstrom. When I first heard of his transition from OCR, I personally wanted to do whatever possible to deliver a strong message of appreciation for his accomplishments, as well as for who he is as a person. Among the people with whom I communicated for recognizing John was our governor, Ned Lamont. And I'm actually thrilled to turn the floor over to the governor to provide some of his thoughts on John. Here's to John Soderstrom in 25 years as head of the Yale Office of Cooperative Research. Connecticut's always been the entrepreneurial capital of the world. Ask uh, Yale's very own Eli Whitney or down the street, U Igor Sikorsky. And uh, life sciences generating the next generation of innovation. Yale has been a leader there. John has been a leader there. Look, the um, Office of Cooperative Research, 75 Yale spin ups, 2 billion in venture capital, 7 billion in public equity. And more importantly, these are life saving medicines that are changing people's lives. Look, my friend uh, David Shear gave a big shout out to make sure, John, we remember you on this uh, day, 25 years of serving our state and helping entrepreneurs get going. And I love the idea of your Scholars Fund, helping other young people focus on STEM so they get the best opportunity in life. You're the very best of Connecticut, thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Lamont, for sharing our excitement regarding John's accomplishments. Um, we will now have a live panel discussion, which is being moderated by David Shear. David has been president of Shear and Company since 1981 with a successful track record of building companies, providing corporate strategic and transactional advisory services. He co-founded and served on the board of Achillion Pharmaceuticals, which was acquired by Alexion in February of 2020. He is chair of the board of Adela Inc., Refactor Health, Revelar Biotherapeutics, and Twist Biosciences. He is also involved with several other private and publicly held companies serving on many boards, including the BioCT Board of Directors. David continually gives back to industry leading conferences, part of the CT Coronavirus Task Force, the Global Virus Task Force, guest lecturer, and on many advisory committees. Please join me in a warm welcome and thank you to David Shear. 
Thank you, Dawn. I, I just want to correct one thing. I'm not on the board of TWIST, but I am chairman of the board of a TWIST spinoff called Revolar Biotherapeutics we recently launched. Um, before I get into uh, the fireside chat, uh, I have something that's a bit off of the agenda, but I think I hope that John Soderstrom, of course, there are a number of Johns today uh, in this meeting. Um, I'm looking at least one another of them, but I, I want to mention a, there's a special little um, sort of thing that I'd like to sort of uh, read for John and about John. And this comes from uh, actually John. Nidlamont, the governor. Um, it's a special proclamation, um, John. Um, can you show John Soderstrom's screen? Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, can we see John? I, I want to make should, sure. I, I want to make sure that John. I want to make sure that we get the, the maximum benefit from uh, you know I, I I'm not going to say his embarrassment but really just the the, the tribute here. Great. Okay. So um, this is a uh, something by the way it's on its way in hard copy for you, John, which is why I had to uh, mysteriously ask you for your home address yesterday. But um, anyway, uh, this is by His Excellency Ned Lamont, Governor, an official statement. On behalf of the state of Connecticut, I, Ned Lamont, governor, take great pleasure in congratulating John Soderstrom, PhD, as you are honored by the BioCT for your contributions to the Yale Office of Cooperative Research and to Yale. This recognition celebrates your many incredible contributions to the greater New Haven community and to the state of Connecticut. After graduating Northwestern University with a PhD in industrial psychology, you began your career at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in technology transfer and business development. In 1996, you were recruited to Yale University, brought on board by Greg Gardner at the Office of Cooperative Research as a successor in the role of managing director. In the 25 years since you started as managing director, the OCR has thrived. Your impact, impact on Connecticut's bioscience entrepreneurial sector has been incredible. Under your leadership, the OCR has launched dozens of new ventures, a diverse portfolio expanded to include not only bioscience, but also quantum computing, semiconductors, and software. These vast undertakings have driven the creation of thousands of jobs and brought billions of dollars of new investment into Connecticut. Your energy, enthusiasm, and leadership are laudable. This recognition is a tribute to your outstanding professional talent and acumen. You have my best wishes for continued success in all of your future endeavors. Therefore, I, Ned Lamont, Governor of the State of Connecticut, on this day of December 14th, 2022, do hereby officially convey honor and recognition upon John Soderstrom, PhD in the State of Connecticut. Signed, Ned Lamont, Governor. Anyway, <clears throat> anyway that is a little bit off agenda. <clears throat> Back to the agenda. <clears throat> we have a fireside chat, John, here. This is not a roast, even though fireside might actually connote heat and maybe, you know, roasting. But we actually have five leaders from the life science community here, all of whom know you well. Um, and each of whom can bring a, a very unique perspective uh, on your contributions. Our panel consists of John Houston, CEO of Arvinus, Amanda Hayward, who's business model lead from Rally Bio and actually a major contributor in life sciences in the state, former colleague of mine as well. Um, Tim Shannon, general partner of Canyon Partners. Uh, John Swartley, associate vice president for research and, and, and executive director for the Penn Center of Innovation, one of your trainees and mentor mentees. Uh, and Sean McKay, the CEO of Isoplexus. Before we get to this, to the comments from this truly distinguished group of speakers, I'd like to briefly share some of my own thoughts. So sorry, John, you're not getting away with, without my saying a few extra words about you here. But I first met you, I met John back in the 2000 timeframe when I, I sort of shared with Yale the fact that we were looking to launch a new company in the antibiotic space, which, it, which was called Achillion. And, and uh, we we had at that time, you know, sort of zinc finger targets as a as a as a uh, a business plan. Uh, never really happened that way, but we ended up in a conversation with Yale, with actually Greg Gardner and John, about bringing together uh, what we were doing and what Yale was doing with Tommy Chang and some of his antiviral compounds. 
And uh, in point of fact, we, we did make a deal. Uh, and it was actually one of the early deals that, uh, that I know you made at Yale. Uh, and, and Achillean, of course, years later became part of Alexion and AstraZeneca. But there was one aspect of that, of that case study which I thought was really interesting. And if there's anything that really speaks to John, who John is and how much of, of a champion he is for Connecticut, even back then he said, you know something, we're not doing this deal unless the company is in New Haven. It was, a, it was a deal closing condition. And you know what? If it weren't for that comment from you, John, Achillean would never have been in Connecticut. And it, so I, I just thought that was something that was really, I think it, it speaks to a little bit about who you are. Um, and I, I spent a, a quite a number of, of, of years in, in time working with uh, OCR and yourself over the, over the uh, uh, you know, the, the subsequent years launched some other companies, Aptherion, Exurion, which is now Renetics doing really well in spinal cord and, and currently work with two Yale spin outs, other ones, Refactor Health and Thyron. Um, I should say for, for anyone who doesn't know this, although most people do, I mean, I did some benchmarking on, on research commercialization offices across the country for work I was doing up in, in Toronto. And, and I'll tell you that John, John is really one of the most highly recognized people in this field, bar none. And in fact, I think it's also important to say that OCR is really a benchmark for many other offices at major universities around the country. You know, my company building path uh, and it wasn't always wine and roses. And even my relationship with John was not always wine and roses. Um, I found myself during a period of time uh, on the proverbial different wavelength from John. I think I probably was unique in that in that regard. So that was like an, um, that was a modest roast there. But anyway, um, I came to realize that it wasn't possible to please everyone all the time, including myself. Having said that, and now we're going to get to something that's a little bit more serious. In 2013, an important event in my life catalyzed a remarkable change in the relationship with John. Our daughter had a near fatal health challenge while she was in college down in Dallas. Miraculously, she survived and currently is thriving as a third year law student. Um, John heard about this and, and, he, and he invited me out to lunch. And we had a dad to dad conversation, which really let me understand a great deal more about who John was as a person, setting aside all of his accomplishments and strengths and talents relative to um, what he's done in, in research commercialization. I learned, and, and the fact that he was an icon in this field, he, I, I learned so much about him as a person. Um, and, and those, those lessons really I, catalyzed a, a major change in terms of a relationship that has really become a close, chain, a close relationship with him. From then on, we, we cultivated a great friendship, a lot of mutual respect. I found myself turning to you on many occasions, John, when I had problems with deals. These are deals that had nothing to do with Yale, but, but everything to do with finding someone who could really give me uh, a sense of great wisdom and insight. Um, and you always came through, and I'm sure you always will come through in the future with, with that common sense and how to reach a path to closure. Um, I, I've also jokingly, or not so jokingly, often referred to you as my rabbi. God knows how that could really be the case, right? But, but it turns out on some level that that's really the, the conversations that we have had in the conversation we had in 2013 really were almost spiritual. It's, it's for those reasons and others that I can think of no better qualified person to receive this level of tribute at this time in, in, in your career as you're transitioning from Yale. I know that you're gonna be pursuing a new chapter uh, in, in, in career and life, which will undoubtedly be very exciting, productive. And I know you're going to be uh, continuing to be a major contributor in our life science ecosystem. And again, congratulate you for all those years and also just feel very blessed that you and I, you know, have that friendship and that relationship, you know, professionally, which I think has been so important to me. So now moving on, you know, uh, I'd like to get to the panel. Um, and in, in that panel, uh, the panel, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to start with John Houston. Um, I'd like I'd ask you to lead us off. But by the way, I'm, I'm giving your last name here for all the Johns here. So, you know, I'm not trying, I don't want this to be too formal. Okay. But 
I'd like to have you lead us off with a bit of your history of OCR with John and how you've been able to work with Yale in building one of the most successful companies in the biotechnology field. And congratulations to you on that. And a company that the state of Connecticut is highly proud of. So John, please take it from there. Thanks, thanks, David. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to be on this uh, panel and uh, talk about John. So yeah, we, uh, the first time I interacted with John, uh, tail end of 2016, I uh, was it just coming off of leaving BMS. I'd been there for nearly 19 years and 10 years prior to that at, uh, at Glaxo in the UK. So I was a big pharma guy. And I was um, looking for reasons uh, to like go back into work, basically, because <laughs> um, I was kind of enjoying not working anymore. And uh, this great, uh, this uh, great interaction I had with uh, initially Craig Cruz and Tim Shannon, saying, "Look, this this is a fabulous company, Arvinus. Uh, they're looking for a chief scientific officer. I think I'll have a lot of fun." And I still had some concerns being a big pharma person and would work in a small biotech. And I remember interacting with the different board members at the time. And uh, and John was uh, the the one. It was he was kind of interesting because he's basically saying Yale sees this company as a company that's really important to us. Uh, we want it to be successful. So basically, you you know if you if you join, you're going to have fun, but you better deliver. <laughs> and John's always had that light, slight undertone with me, which has been you're going to love it. You're doing great. You better deliver, um, which is great because I think that's what you always need. You need a a board member that encourages you, gives you advice. Um, supports you when you need supported, but it's always setting the, 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 the standard. And uh, my relationship with John got off to a great start from then. And uh, every, every board meeting we had after that, and certainly in the first, uh, the first year of my time at the, the company was great because he expressed that kind of support uh, to me and the milestones to me on a regular basis. And when I talked to the leadership team at Arvinus, I realized that this is something John had been doing right from the get-go. This wasn't just purely for me. Um, when, when Arvinus was set up, he was instrumental uh, in a lot of ways, David, that echoes some of the conversation you've had about how he influenced where the company should be, uh, a Connecticut-based focus, uh, and the types of people that should be there. Um, and I think he set a, a, a standard along with Tim and Craig of uh, how a company should be set up. And Arvinus um, really was uh, a, a great startup. It attracted uh, great chemists and biologists from the, the beginning. And by the time I joined them, I think I was employee around employee number 40, 41. And all the potential that had been building up since 2013 was, was there. And, uh, and uh, the, the team that uh, John had been involved in as, as part of the board there had done a great job of getting it to, to that stage. So I, I credit John uh, with recognizing the opportunity, uh, encouraging uh, a Yale spin out to be based in Connecticut, to be based in New Haven, and on a personal basis, supporting me uh, through those early days of being a CSO, then fairly rapidly becoming a CEO uh, and supporting me through that transition as well. So to you, John, thank you. Uh, Arvinus thanks you as well. Because uh, uh, the the company uh, from that that ground basis has uh, has has done very well, but it's because of those kind of uh, the roots that were placed at the beginning, and all the great advice that was given as well. So thank you, John. Well, thank you, John. Wait, this again. We have to. So many Johns here today, but anyway. Um, so the the next person actually there, there's a, there's another Yale spin out here, and that is a person who spun out as a postdoc from Yale, you know, a number of years ago, and I had the great fortune to be able to work with her over quite a number of years. And Amanda Hayward, um, Amanda, I would love for you to uh, to give your perspectives. You've, you've sort of been involved in so many of the grassroots activities associated with OCR and, and, uh, and now, you know, she's, you, know, you have really, um, you know, risen to be such an important part of our life science ecosystem in Connecticut and beyond. So please uh, share some of your experiences. Thank you, David. Um, and thanks also to you, Dawn, for um, inviting me to be part of this panel to celebrate with John today. Um, John, it's good to see you. Um, so first, I want to start out by saying that I have been lucky enough to know and work with John for now over 20 years, um, which, is, which is saying something. Um, as David mentioned, um, ever since I left my postdoctoral position at Yale and went to join David at Sharing Company, and uh, Yale was one of the first universities I got to interact with um, in that role. 
And at that time, I knew absolutely nothing about intellectual property or tech transfer or licensing. Um, and it was a really a good place to, uh, to gain that understanding working with you, John. And um, you've been a actually a fantastic professional mentor and were a fantastic professional mentor for me at that time as I learned the business. And one thing that really jumped out for me was when I went to um, do similar kinds of work with other universities um, and I really realized the difference between the way that you'd sort of set up your organization and your team and the way that other um, universities were, were approaching um, academic licensing. And um, really what jumps out is, is the way that you and Yale sort of enable partnership um, and really that interaction between the university, founders, management team and investors and sort of enabling entrepreneurship across the board and really finding um, creative ways to move technologies forward. And, and um, that's not the same everywhere and, and definitely was something that I learned a lot about working with you at Yale. So since those early years, um, I've had a, a number of different um, business development and venture capital roles um, with, with a number of organizations. And with every single one of those roles, I've, I've gotten to work with John um, and had very constructive professional relationships. Um, Yale and John's office is always sort of one of the first go-to places for me when I'm going to, to sort of look for new and interesting entrepreneurial opportunities and, and technologies that could really make a difference. Um, so that's the professional side. I, I also want to just um, say a few things on, on the personal side. So um, during my 20 year uh, sort of career on the business side, and as I tr transition between these different roles, John's actually been a, a very generous um, personal mentor for me, which is much appreciated. Um, and a great sounding board, never too busy to take a call or a meeting or breakfast at Christie's. Um, and and um, beyond personal advice, uh, also has made um, his network uh, very much available and made a lot of great connections for me. Um, and that's um, and has always been very kind. So, so on the personal side, as well as the professional side, I've really um, appreciated my relationship with you, John, over the years. So perhaps one other thing just to touch on is, is John's um, sort of professional style, um, very no nonsense approach to uh, negotiations, um, and really enabling a path forward in any deal. And you always know exactly where you are with John in real time. And that isn't always comfortable, especially when you're on the other side of the table. Um, but what it does enable is, is for one to get through sort of roadblocks and, and really get the deal done. Um, and I will also say, John, that you and your team have always been willing to find creative ways uh, to, to sort of get through those roadblocks, creative solutions that enable companies to continue even in difficult times. Um, and maybe just one example I'll give, and I won't give any names, um, but a company that um, I was involved in founding more than 10 years ago. It was a spin out from Yale. Um, so we were at a particularly difficult time. Um, we were having a hard time raising money. We'd had a setback with a major partnership. We had a couple of um, members of our senior leadership team that had, had departed. Um, and and you know, we, were, we were in a tough place and we had some really significant financial obligations to Yale through licensing, sponsored research, consulting. And it was, it was really it was really important. John was able to to really sort of cut through the the issues and um, make some very significant concessions and changes to the contract so we could keep the company going. That technology is now in the clinic. Um, it is offering real promise to patients with a, a major unmet need. And I would say with, without your partnership, John and Yale's partnership, that company would have gone under and. and you know, that technology would not have been available to patients today. Um, so I think I'll stop here um, and just say that, John, you've really been a visionary um, for technology licensing and company creation at Yale. And it has been my privilege to work with you. Mute myself here. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I, I should say that um, if you ever have any real questions about how to interact with John, what I would recommend a book, there's a book called Swedishness. It's actually very, very, it's, it's a very, um, it's a short book, but it tells you everything you need to know. Anyway, let's, we'll move on to the next, the next speaker here. 
the, the next speaker is uh, someone that I know I interacted with years ago when he was at Yale, John Swartley. Um, and, uh, and John, uh, you know, comes to us to sort of talk to us about what was it like to work for John? What is it? What was it like to be a mentee of John's? I hope you'll come up with a story that's going to be most embarrassing because I promised John if there would be no embarrassment here, but I, I, and he doesn't like surprises as well, but I'm just going to surprise him with the fact that maybe there's a surprise that you might be able to share with us. But, but I, I think to your credit, John Swartley, though, I mean, you, you, uh, you've had a, a pretty amazing career of your own, you know, now leading uh, one of the other, uh, you know, very uh, successful and really the leading, one of the leading uh, research commercialization offices in the country. So yeah, congratulations to you on, on where you have arrived. Uh, but I'd love, we'd love to hear a bit about your experience with John from those years at Yale. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, Dave, David. Th and thank you, Don, for, for the kind invite uh, to today. Um, it, where, where to start? I, th I actually think John might, might have appreciated a roast. And maybe we can redo this at some, some point with, uh, with some embarrassing stories. But I, I'll probably I'll, I'll stick to the high road for, for today, I think. Um, and, and by the way, those of you who know me um, know how, how how much I hate putting on a, a necktie. So this is really a, this is a, a very strong symbol of my respect for you, John, that I that I, that I put on the, the form the formal garment. Um, I joined OC, I, I am I am in one of one of the older alums of of, of OCR, um, and, and my my tenure goes back to the to the mid mid nineties. Um, and you know I was thinking about you know what what I wanted to say today, and I I, I joined. I joined OCR. I, I met Greg Gardner and I met John Soderstrom, um, and I, I, I really, you know, I was leaving the laboratory at that time. Um, you know, after a you know reasonably successful academic career, I had to make a decision whether I was going to stick in academia or, or move into uh, in, into the, the the space between academia and, and the industrial sector. And I, I was really, I, I was sold on OCR because of what Greg and John were trying to do. First of all, the name, o OCR, it was like the weirdest name out there um, for tech trans. Everyone else was TTO or tech transfer. And this this thing was OCR. Like, what, what does that even mean? And, and what are we supposed to, you know, in, to interpret? And, and I was, I think, I, I think I recall that it was actually called OCR on purpose to, to kind of create, a, a, you know, sort of a little bit of an ambiguous, uh, you know, de definition that could become almost anything. And, and that was one of the things I discovered with the, you know, work, working with John is, is, is that, um, you know, I, I spent about half my time doing the traditional tech transfer and the other half of my time um, building companies and doing, doing cre creative things. And, and uh, Yale and OCR at that time were, were one of the few places in the world where you where you could where you could do that, and that was a, completely attributable to the leadership of Greg, 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 and John. And um, you know that was that really had a humongous impact on my on my career um, because I really I learned I learned some really fundamental things from 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 that that experience uh, working with John. Um, I mean, one one of those things is. Um, you know, not, but not, don't be afraid of creative ideas, even if they seem like they're completely nuts. Um, you, know, you, 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 you mentioned the, you know, the Achillean discussion. There were a few aspects of that that got, you know, a little, a, a little, a little um, in, in, interesting, in, including, you're right, um, you know, this company would have been in, in uh, I think it would have been in Tennessee had <laughs> John not insisted that it be in New Haven. But uh, he used to call me the scavenger. I, I think it was scavenger garbage man, because I was always looking for un, untapped, uh, this you know this disclosure and in technology information in, in sort of in the stacks that I could turn into you know that I could spin into spin into gold and and that you know that would have been impossible anywhere else but you know I was encouraged to do that and that you know that really told me a lot about you know the character of of, of the leadership at at, at OCR uh, you know the other thing they were really good they hired good people they give give them a clear objective and vision and then let them do their thing. And, and that, is, that is absolutely a management style that I have adopted through my, my career subsequent to, to OCR. I mean, just look, look at the team that exists at OCR now, look at their performance over the last 20 years and, and you, you, you're left with no, 
you know, no doubt of how how powerful that that you know their their management style has been. Um, the other thing that was really interesting about OCR um, and, and was one of the earliest examples of this was, you know, a lot a lot of the other offices focused on sort of the buy dole side of things, the administrative component, you know, file the patents and you know and and you know try try to like sell, sell them, you know, at kind of as is to 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 the private sector. OCR wasn't about that. OCR was was more about I, I, we want to understand our partner. We want to figure out what makes you know the 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 industrial side of things um, in, interested in 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 what we're what we're doing and and vice versa. So there was a lot of you know a lot of study. You know, one thing that I noticed, you know, John did a lot of he, he studied he's and they weren't adversaries; they're partners. He studied he studied the uh, you know sort of the, the the other side. He wanted to understand them. We did things really early on, like go out to the J.P. Morgan conference, for example. We were the first academic institution there for a long time, and the reason was, you know, it was it was because of that, you know, wanting to be, um, you know, a part, a true partner to really understand the the needs and and the and the motives of of uh, you know of of the the, the counterparties. And I, I've 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 adopted all all of these. I've, I I. Was saying earlier, I, I shamelessly steal all good ideas, and and a lot of what I'm now doing at Penn is direct is a direct lineage from things I learned from from John and Greg at uh, at, at OCR. So I'm you know incredibly grateful for that. But I I'm, I'm actually probably even more grateful for one one very specific thing, um, and I I, I did want to mention this, that, and I can't even recall exactly when we had this conversation, but at at some point. John had, uh, you know, they basically took me aside and, and and had a had a had a conversation with me, which is has been is, has been a really important conversation for me, you know, over the last two two, two decades plus. And I think, as you all know, I mean, John cre created one of the most productive, te you know, tech transfer organizations of all time. He is the leading voice in our industry, has been for many 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 years. But one thing that you would never you would never miss if you spent any time with John is he never failed to emphasize the overarching importance of his family and faith. And, you know, and when this when we had this conversation, what one of the things that John wanted me to understand was, was at least the, the importance for him of work life balance and 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 he, he communicated that in, in a really, in a really elegant way. Um, and, and, and it had to do with you know the ability to do a good day's work, to be proud of that work, but then to separate yourself from it and devote your full time and attention to your family and non work non work um, interests and pursuits. And, and I was probably too young to really appreciate that. I might have even been pre kids when we had that conversation. But over time, I've really I've really revisited that and really understood what what that means. You know, he, he was talking about you know some roles. And you know some career paths are better than others at, at allowing you to achieve that work-life balance. And, and I think the other thing that he he told me was you might give up some aspects um, of you know uh, of a potential career pursuit, such as you know pure monetary returns. But what you gain in return is worth far more. And I think I think that's there's a truth to that that I have that I have discovered uh, over over the years. And I am. Greatly appreciative of John for for sharing that with me. So thank you, John. Thank you for being such a great mentor, colleague, and and friend. And congratulations. Well, thank you, John Swartley. That that's a great it was a great tribute. Um, and I and I really so much resonate to some of the observations you've made as well about John. So the next the next uh, speaker here is a legend in his own right. Um, you know, as a venture capitalist, but also had early in his career as a um, uh, as a, an entrepreneur and executive in, in biotech. And I can think of no more important person, uh, you know, other than John, perhaps in, in the life science, Connecticut life science community, uh, than Tim Shannon for all that he has done in his career in bringing companies forward and providing them capital and beyond that, even providing them, you know, so, so much in the way of experience and leadership. So, so Tim, I know what you wanted to do today was to not necessarily regale us with all of the companies that you've built with John, but rather I think you, you would like to help us understand what the impacts have been more broadly in terms of ecosystems. So Tim, why don't you take it from here? Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. 
Yeah, so, um, you know, first, you know, just David, thanks and Dawn and, and thanks to the committee for giving me this opportunity to speak at this uh, great event um, uh, where we honor John. Uh, you know, I couldn't be uh, happier uh, for that chance. Uh, as David, as you mentioned, you know, we've done a lot of companies uh, together and um, had some great success and a lot of fun doing that. But really what I wanted to do is talk a little bit more about some of the adjacent things that, that John has built into the community really, you know, to support that ecosystem, uh, make it thrive and, and frankly, make it durable, um, you know, because what he has is, is built will endure. And, and, you know, part of what I want to talk about is, is you know, some of the people side of that. And, um, and frankly, you know, some of that starts to starts right with OCR, you know, which we've mentioned today and the, and the people there. So, you know, as a leader, you know, a testament to leadership is being able to, you know, uh, attract and retain great people. And I think, you know, I, I scan through who's on the call. I think all of us have had, you know, tons of interaction with, with the group John is, is been able to um, bring in and, and, and to lead. And I think, you know, some of the things I'm gonna mention, you know, are a testament to John's leadership and that group as a whole, um, really, and what they've contributed to the uh, community. So, you know, when I, when I think about these things, I, you know, I think about the things that, that I've been pulled into because of my relationship with OCR and with John, you know, that, and where I've been able to help uh, uh, in their efforts. And, you know, many of those things, again, are, again, about trying to really make the community, the community grow and, and endure, and providing you know opportunities for uh, entrepreneurs to do what they do, but also to train the next generation of entrepreneurs. And you know the events I think of that many of us are participating in are things like Pitch Fest, um, you know, which is is grown enormously, and where I think many of us have been able to be involved and be judges. And that is sort of morphed into now a bit of a feeder for. Uh, the Blavatnik Fund uh, uh, system and, and the program uh, where, you know, again, faculty and entrepreneurs are able to sort of refine their, their pitches and their business plan through Pitch Fest and then through some, uh, you know, pre-work leading into the Blavatnik Fund and to be able to compete for funds, um, you know, to help advance their, their work, um, you know, to points where they're, you know, in a better position to create a company or um, to license their technology out. So just you know, those two programs alone, I think have probably increased the entrepreneurs or faculty entrepreneurs or student entrepreneurs, you know, at Yale, you know, in the order of hundreds, um, you know, in a very short period of time. And, and having been involved with a lot of those programs from, from the start, um, you know, and had the chance to participate in year over year, again, the progression and the quality of the technologies and the plans around those technologies and how you know faculty and students and, and fellows are able to represent those is just you know a fantastic testament to, to John and his group. Um, another you know favorite of mine that we were able to start with John is um, I think we call the the Canaan uh, Yale event, Yale Venture Fellows Program or Yale calls it the Yale Canaan Venture Fellows Program I'm sure. But again, this is a program where um, you know, we've worked with this John and his group to uh, recruit, you know, interested MD, PhD, or MD, PhD students who are really interested in learning about um, the startup process and, and venture capital. And it's just been an extraordinary pleasure to be involved in, to be able to be exposed to just, you know, such young, capable people and, and help them grow and, and help them, uh, you know, achieve their goals. And again, you know, there, there are probably 50 of those who've come to the program so far, you know, that we, we stay in touch with both, you know, OCR and, and, and the Canaan side of this. And, and many of those people who have gone on into the ecosystem, either in startups, including some of our startups here, startups on the West Coast, um, others um, are, you know, in, in banking, others are, some are in venture capital, and, and others are in consulting in the ecosystem. And whether they, they stay here locally or they, they travel around to other uh, you know, hubs in the country, you know, one thing they retain is incredibly strong ties uh, with Yale and strong passion for all things Yale because of, of these programs. Um, the final event I'd mentioned that again, many of us have been able to participate in uh, that I, I think just is really um, you know, spectacular event is the Yale Innovation Summit. Um, so again, this is you know, a relatively new event. Um, you know, held at the School of Business 
you know, obviously much more interesting when we could do it in person than with Zoom. But you know, it's just an event that lets Yale showcase itself to a, a very broad audience. You know, bringing in thousands of participants from outside, you know, the New Haven and Connecticut community. Um, you know, really talking about global and, and national issues in regards to innovation and entrepreneurship, but in doing it in a way where, you know, John's really has a beautiful way to showcase Yale and, and what Yale's delivering um, you know, to the ecosystem. And again, this is just an event that has really expand, you know, the, the world's window into, into what Yale can provide. Um, now, another part I want to talk about is, is just about New Haven itself and, and, and John's commitment, not only to help Yale, but to help the, the New Haven community of, of, of which we're part. Um, this is, you know, I think an issue we, uh, you know, almost immediately hit it off on. Um, you know, I'm sure some of you are bored with my stories, but uh, my family started on Howard Avenue in the Hill. And uh, I went to grammar school at, at Sacred Heart on, on Columbus Avenue. So. You know, New Haven is 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 uh, near and dear to me, and um, you know, a big part of my my experience. Um, you know, but the the economic development aspects of this are staggering. So I think David or the governor mentioned the aggregate number of of dollars that John and his group have brought into um, into the area. I can just say that just Canaan alone now has exceeded a quarter of a billion dollars of investment. Uh, in Connecticut, and I don't have the exact breakout, but I would imagine at least 90% of that is, is Yale companies in and around New Haven. So just, you know, a, a spectacular number, um, and it's a spectacular testament to John, and, and frankly, a, a great opportunity um, for Canaan. But, you know, beyond that money, I think, you know, John's always been interested in opportunities, you know, for the people of New Haven and, and the community, um, you know, that we share with the people of New Haven. Um, and in that respect, when you're starting a company with John, in addition to, you know, the master and deal doing, he also on the side is, is a major real estate broker. Um, so, so John is always quick, um, you know, to offer your startup, you know, a, a space somewhere in New Haven. And even though that space is incredibly tight, you know, John immediately goes into sort of that real estate broker mode to make sure any company that's getting started around Yale technology really thinks long and hard about, about putting their company in New Haven. And I think, you know, all of mine have, have stayed there again because we share that passion for, for trying to things, make things better for the city and its people. Uh, our companies, as all of you know, who are in the ecosystem are really, you know, in places of high need. So, you know, our companies in, in Science Park, you know, are adjacent to, to New Hallville, um, and the companies, um, you know, closer to the medical school are obviously, you know, adjacent between downtown and the hill section. So, you know, the hope there is, is some of the benefits of those companies and things those companies need become uh, business opportunities for people in the community. And if you, you go to Science Park or, um, you know, go to the companies downtown near the medical school, you'll see, you know, companies that are spawned, service organizations that are spawned, and housing that's created that again uh, makes these a better place uh, for all of us uh, to live. Uh, I think the other thing we focused on is um, you know the Yale students are phenomenal, um, but there there are other people in our communities who aren't Yale students where you know we we've looked for ways to try to bring them into to our ecosystem, um, uh, into our lab-based companies in particular. Uh, so again, we've you know with John's support and with a number of other people committed to this in the ecosystem, we've. We do a lot of outreach to the universities where there really is an enrichment for students from the New Haven area. So the, the local places, so UNH, Gateway, Southern, uh, Albertus. And we go into those again with the goal of, of trying to you know, create opportunities close by for those students in their communities you know, where they can uh, start their careers. Um, one of my current companies, you know, we, we've had a great time with this. Uh, it's a company called Halda. And we've developed an entity within Halda called uh, Halda U, and um, and this is to denote that um, you know we've had a wonderful time recruiting interns uh, from many of those schools I've just mentioned, and uh, these are you know students graduating with some element of, of scientific skills and, and laboratory skills, and yeah you know, we bring them in and, and put them through a, a training program, and almost all of those uh, students have evolved into full time roles in our startups, and you know they. Pr pr provide a great resource for us 
but you know the young people really get stoked to have that that sort of opportunity you know at a company um you know right right in the location uh you know where they where, where they were you know, raised and grew up and educated um I, you know i think the one thing we've struggled with and and this will be the, the final thing i say is you know in those efforts we haven't had as much luck uh recruiting um young people who are underrepresented in our industry uh, and, uh, you know, who are in those neighborhoods where we, we live and work. And I think, you know, this has been, um, you know, not despite effort, but, you know, you know, continues to be a, a shortfall for the industry overall, uh, but certainly continues to be an issue for us, um, you know, here in New Haven. Uh, you know, these are complicated issues and they've existed for a long time. And um, so the solutions obviously aren't easy, but uh, we, we need to can try to do a better job, you know, getting uh, people who are underrepresented in our industry into our uh, industry. You know, I, I think while a complicated problem, I think part of it is simple and, and part of it is, is giving those young people the chance to aspire to do what we do and to have the confidence and the courage, you know, to dedicate the early part of their life to, you know, the education and the commitment you need to be ready to take on. Uh, these endeavors. Uh, and, you know, I, as I mentioned, I, I went to Sacred Heart uh, in the Hill and, and three years later, I went to high school at, at Hopkins, um, you know, which is a, a totally different environment yet within, within the same town. And, you know, one, the contrast to me was striking in terms of, you know, the aspirations at a place like Hopkins were, you know, over the top, um, you know, frankly, to the point of being precocious. And they weren't only expectations or aspirations, they were expectations and actually, you know, backed by results. And that was in quite contrast to, you know, what I experienced in, in the Sacred Heart uh, experience uh, in the Hill. And while that, that's dated now, unfortunately, I don't think it is so dated. Um, you know, I don't think that the, that difference in aspirations and expectations uh, has really changed in a positive way. Um, you know, over the last few decades, if anything, it, it may be a, a bit more of a problem. And I, I think that's really a tragedy. So you know, I think that uh, remains a, a big need and something we all need to commit to try to change. So I think it's, it's incredibly fitting that the, the Soderstrom Fund, Scholars Fund, you know, represents a great capstone to John's legacy, you know, trying to bridge this gap in aspirations and really, you know, trying to create those, those, those great opportunities for those underrepresented kids in, in these neighborhoods, you know, really to give them a chance to, to get on the fast track into these careers, you know, we've all been able to um, have a wonderful, you know, experience with, um, but they need to be more accessible and they need, they need to be accessible to the, the people who, who live around us. And uh, I look forward to working with John and the group of people who are gonna be doing the work around this fund, you know, to provide that mentorship and leadership to try to make a change in that regard. So John, congratulations on this, this honor. Um, personally, it's been an honor for me to know and, and work with you over the years. And uh, I look for more of that in the years to come. Thanks. Well, Tim, that's, that was a great, some great comments. Really appreciate those. I'm sure John does as well. Last but not least is someone that I, I hear about all the time, but I don't think he and I have actually had much of anything to do with each other yet, but this is an opportunity to meet him. So that was great. Sean McKay, who's like the CEO of Isoplexus. And this is another example of a successful uh, endeavor of John's in terms of the launch of a Yale, a Yale company that has really made an important contribution and is, represents something that I know the state is extremely proud of. So Sean, please take it from here. Thanks, David. Nice to meet you. I'm sure we'll be in touch after too. It's been a busy year. The, uh, um, yeah, John, John has been, I've interacted with John since like 2012 or 2013 or so. Um, I think a couple themes that are that resonate with me, and I th I think the the overarching thing is like John and I, OCR as a reflection of John, because I think a lot of orgs tend to be a reflection of their leader one way or the other. Ends up being this. Uh, I think it's a for us it was a very entrepreneurial environment, and I think John's a very entrepreneurial person. And I think, but I, and I think there's like deep roots there. And I, I don't know, John, you've told me stories and about your parents and like all these things about, you know, logistical entrepreneurship and things. So I think that there's like, there's deep roots there, but I think it's evident in, you know, two, two aspects of it. There's this, there's this for us, we had started this company in 2013, Isoplexus, 
because I, you know, zero employees outside of me and Rong Fan and, you know, one of our co-founders, an undergrad, you know, all, all of which was Caro, which was all just, it was at that time a concept around some, you know, some new intellectual property to do with uh, single cell biology, which at that time was just, you know, kind of, let's say, let's say unknown to say the least. And I think in, at the same time, there was like around everything that we're doing, there was a lot of big companies that sort of, I, I felt like wanted to come in, take a technology, you know, sort of own it and one in a million chance they do something with it, but maybe put it on the shelf. And so like, you know, OCR had a lot of opportunity to sort of work with a variety of folks around wrong and, and wrongs technology and wrong and myself. And they sort of bet on us and we, you know, in some ways we were the most qualified people because of our great, you know, highly persistent attitudes. And at the same time, both the least qualified people just based on sort of inexperience launching these companies. But I think, you know, they were really patient with us. There was a lot of, you know, I, I just recall like uh, me asking John and the team just lots of questions and sitting there at the OCR offices and everyone saying, okay, you know, we'll answer these sort of silly questions, you know, about like, you know, just kind of, kind of asinine stuff around IP. And, you know, they forgave me when I'd call very expensive IP lawyers that, you know, weren't, weren't the OCR IP lawyers. And, you know, John would be like, well, Sean, you know, the, they're going to charge us, not you, right? Like if, <laughs> if this company doesn't sort of move forward, um, you know, so we, I, I think just there was a big bet on us as new entrepreneurs, a, a lot of investment on the front end. And that sort of translated to this, you know, YEI fund. There's just a big learning community. And that was all just really helpful because we wouldn't, you never know in hindsight, but we wouldn't really have, without some of the mentors through the Entrepreneurial Institute and the investment from the Entrepreneurial Institute all around the OCR, it would have been tough to see a path to say, de-risking at that sort of very earliest stage where we got our seed round together. So that was one thing. And then I think there's, you know, I, I, I do think this, I hope it continues with the Yale Entrepreneurial Offices around OCR, but there's definitely this, to be an entrepreneur, you know, like John is, I, I think you, you have to sort of be, you have to be intelligent about it, but you do have to be patient. These are really long-term things, right? Like all these companies, we went public, you know, we have 400 employees. It's like, it's fun, it's exciting. We have products that customers love, but, you know, it's been 10, almost 10 years, right? <laughs> so we have to have some persistence in patience. And there's been this sort of, it's been an upward path, but it's been this sort of, you know, non-linear sort of circuitous path. And I think there's definitely, and we've licensed multiple things from Yale and there's always been a great collaboration around it. And some of the new investors say, oh, we don't like this, we don't like that. And there's always been this just very collaborative mentality. And it's been necessary to see us through to where we are today and being patient about what we do with the technologies and how we use them, just as long as there's good faith that like, you know, we're not sort of sitting in the corner and not doing anything. I think, you know, I, I thought that that was really important to where we got to today and John's influence and sort of my ability to sort of email and say, hey, John, I'd really like it if you could approve this, like whatever it is, this press release, this random thing, you know, it's always sort of same day response and like, hey, we'll take care of it. So that stuff is always, those two things have always spoke to us, just betting on, you know, wrong and myself and the team very early on where you could have maybe done the easier thing at that moment and license it to some big company. But I, I think maybe it would have been less meaningful than, than us building a company and building this you know, 400 people, a lot of which are in Connecticut and manufacturing, biology, you know, informatics, um, generally speaking, just a lot of great people. And then I think just thinking long-term about it, because, you know, our plan is keep cranking along, right? Like stay here, keep growing. We have big growth plans. We've sort of announced those growth plans. And I think that's just fun. And I think, I think that there's, because of the ecosystem you guys have built out of Yale and Yale OCR, there's, um, plenty of programs and um, other companies in the ecosystem, you know, they, they always mention in Silicon Valley, it's like, you know, Steve Jobs and all these people mentioned this beehive where you can actually, it's okay to take risk on companies because you can jump in the next company if this one doesn't work. There is like this around here, right? And it's like really cool because so many talented people are going between these, you know, 20 companies in the last few years or whatever that have been public that can share knowledge and sort of collaborate. And then, you know, other companies as potentially they get acquired, you know, 
we all get the benefits of like uh, some of those employees as well. So it's a really cool ecosystem. It wouldn't have been possible without John's mindset at OCR. And we, we, you know, we wouldn't have been possible in our current iteration uh, without that. I'm sure the technology at some point, you know, would have been successful, but this, this Isoplexus company really benefited from that. So those are, that's my contribution. And John, just really appreciate everything you've done for us as a company and us as a community for the last, you know, uh, quite a while in building this sort of ecosystem around Connecticut and Yale. Well, thank you, Sean. Um, so we, we have another John who's going to be participating in this discussion here, um, John Puses. And actually, John, uh, you're going to be able to give us a little bit more, uh, let's call it current, as well as historical perspectives on working with John Soderstrom. But you also are going to give us a, a little bit of the of the uh, introduction to the uh, the Soderstrom uh, Scholars Fund. So, John Puses, could you take it from here? Um, I'm sorry, David. Um, we're going to show some uh, some videos at the moment. And okay. Then we'll come back to John. Okay. So, John, please hold on. And uh, we're going to take, first of all, I want to thank all of you very much uh, for your time and David for your moderating. And um, as I said, um, we're going to show a video now of some other folks that wanted to say a few words to you, John Soder Soderstrom. <laughs> Hi, I'm Robert Beanstock, Senior Associate General Counsel at Yale for Research and Technology. So that makes me John Soderstrom's lawyer, and I've had the privilege of watching him up close, behind doors, in public for 15 amazing years. You know, when I arrived at my interview in 2006, they had me interview only one client, and that was John Soderstrom, and it was an interview unlike anything I'd ever been on. He was just overflowing with ideas, energy, expertise about technology transfer at Yale, regionally, nationally. It was an amazing conversation. We went well over time and it cinched the deal for me. I was here a couple of months later working by his side, helping him to implement everything that he's brought forward here from um, new, new license structures that align the interests of, of the university and, and startup companies, um, working with, with the private sector to develop tear sheet contracts to get licenses to startups more quickly. I watched him build the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute, bringing in entrepreneurs in, in residence and changing the culture about entrepreneurship at Yale. I've watched him break down town gown barriers to start building a, a regional biotech hub. Um, if, there's any, if there's any one thing that defines the way John approached his, his role, it was to bring together people from different sectors to make a, a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts. And it's been fun negotiating with John. I've never had a better negotiating partner. He sees the forests and the trees, he gets in there, talks to the other side, listens and brainstorms ideas to get to win-win and getting a deal done. John, it has been a great ride. In, in addition to being a true leader, you've been a partner, you've been a friend. I can't wait to see what you do next. All the best to you. I'm delighted to participate in, um, in celebrating John Soderstrom's great contributions. And um, I would like to talk about one that's perhaps less heralded today, and that's his work in the Renaissance of New Haven, which from my perspective in the Office of New Haven and State Affairs at Yale was, of course, very important. And uh, when I came to uh, Yale, um, we developed certain themes around which we had hoped to do our work. And one of the important ones was economic development. And that was to strengthen New Haven with respect to the creation of taxes, tax revenues for the city and, and jobs for the citizens of New Haven. And this, of course, involved um, tech transfer and startup companies. And Yale in those days um, did not have nearly the kind of activity to support entrepreneurial activity as it does today, it's almost hard to imagine uh, two decades ago 
um, how far we still needed to come. And uh, the one person who recognized uh, the potential impact of uh, work and economic development on Yale's efforts to strengthen its host community was John Soderstrom. He was a great partner uh, to me in that regard. Uh, we had many successful ventures. When I came here, there was not one single square foot of commercial biotech space to be leased in the city of New Haven for startup companies coming out of the university and working uh, with Carter Wynn Stanley, uh, John and I put together uh, the George Street Tech Center, which is the first major effort uh, to have biotech space. Um, John was um, terribly important with respect to student activities in the, in, in the uh, area of entrepreneurial activity. And um, he was responsible for supporting Jim Boyle and in a financial way with his budget center in supporting the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute, which was again, one of the early initiatives by the university to um, support faculty and students who wanted to start biotech companies. And John kept that in his budget and he fought for it. And I contributed a little bit out of my budget, but John was the real key person who supported that. So those were a couple examples of the partnership uh, that I had with John. Um, and he had a singular devotion in my view of all the folks in the university when I came to apply the work of his office um, to strengthen New Haven um, and to participate in this effort of the Renaissance in New Haven, which has had such a dramatically positive impact on the city. John was a very important part of that. And so John, I wanna wish you the very best in whatever your next chapter is. I know it's gonna be interesting and important. And I wanna thank you for being such a great partner in um, and, and playing such a key role in our successful efforts uh, with respect to the Renaissance of Yale's host city. I will be eternally grateful for that partnership, John. And I wish you very, very best in the future. Hi, I'm Dave Werzer from Connecticut Innovations, or as we are commonly referred to, CI. So, John Soderstrom is retiring, and after such a successful run at Yale, I believe John has helped ignite the biotech innovation ecosystem in Connecticut over the past 20 plus years. Under his guidance, Yale became a leader in spinning out academic invention and research into companies, and not just startups, but companies employing people in Connecticut, attracting and leveraging substantial investment and capital into the state, and all while helping train and develop the next generation of entrepreneurial leaders for bioscience in Connecticut. Perhaps one of the greatest measures of John's achievements for Yale and for Connecticut is that in 2009, when I started working at CI, John and I met to explore how Yale and Connecticut innovations could best work together. At that time, CI had one investment in a Yale spin out in our active portfolio. And by recent count, 12 years later, we have invested in over 60 Yale startups, creating more than 1,000 jobs in the state. And these spinouts combined with Soderstrom initiatives such as Blavatnik funding and the Yale Innovation Summit have put Connecticut on the map as a US biotech hub. Well done, John, and best of luck in your next endeavors. You will be missed, but the seeds you have sown in Connecticut will continue to blossom for many years to come. Hi, I'm Joe Allen, the Executive Director of the Bayh Coalition, and we greatly appreciate BioConnecticut allowing us to be part of this event honoring John Soderstrom. I've known and admired John for almost 40 years, and I'm happy to be able to present an award recognizing his distinguished career and many contributions, not only to Yale University, but also to our nation. So on behalf of our members of our coalition and our board, our award says, John Soderstrom, a man of integrity, a staunch defender of Bayh-Dole, a person who improved the profession. With deep appreciation for all of your contributions, the Bayh-Dole Coalition. 
So thank you, John, for a job well done. We look forward to continue to work with you for many years to come. Happy holidays to everyone at tonight's BioCT function. My name is Carter Wynn Stanley, and I'm a principal at Wynn Stanley Enterprises. And I feel incredibly fortunate to have the opportunity to speak briefly about my 20 plus year history working with John Soderstrom. But first, I'd like to thank Kelly, Don, and the BioCT team for hosting tonight's event. My first experience with John was late in 1999, or close to 22 years ago now, when I was asked by a partner of ours who was involved with Yale University if I'd be willing to meet with Bruce Alexander and John Soderstrom in New Haven. The purpose of the meeting was to talk about a recent shift at the university toward doing more tech transfer into the private sector. These new companies needed to be located in close proximity to the university, and Yale was looking to partner with a developer to help execute on this goal. Given the success of the market today, this must make our first meeting seem like an easy decision. However, it's worth remembering that in the late 1990s, the life science market was still a very difficult sell outside of a few select markets. There was not a commercial lender willing to invest in New Haven, let alone into the high cost per square foot of lab space in a market where vacancy rates were approaching 30%. While we were certainly aware of other life science clusters popping up around the country, there was no indication at the time that New Haven could be considered one of these. My brother and I headed down to New Haven, unaware that this meeting would change the course of our real estate company for the next several decades. A good part of the meeting was spent walking around the area between Yale Medical School and Chapel Street. Bruce and John had their pitch well choreographed. John was in charge of painting an impressive portrait of what New Haven could or should be. And Bruce was quiet and largely in charge of striking fear into me. At lunch, we listened while John detailed a vision for New Haven that included lab buildings, incubator space, collaboration space. John talked about the importance of importance of proximity. He talked about the importance of connectivity, about having an experienced partner to run facilities. But most of all, John talked about the ability to fill these buildings several times over with successful young startup tenants spinning out of Yale, requiring close proximity to the university. 20 years later, I still think back to that first conversation and the detail that John put forth. Each time along the way, we paused to consider whether we had finally accomplished what we set out to accomplish. John would magically show up at my side, frequently at this event, and say, you know, if you don't get going on the next building, you're going to have nowhere to put these next 10 ten tenants we're raising money for right now. Frequently, I think back to how different my path would have been without John. Then I think about how many other people he's convinced, convinced to move to New Haven, invest in New Haven, teach here, start their companies in the state. I think about Yale, the city, and all of us in the state who are better off today for John's quiet efforts. So John, I would say thank you. Congratulations to a phenomenal career and good luck with your next steps. Don, you're on mute. Okay, I unmuted myself. Um, anyways, thank you everybody. And at this point, you know, I wanna just mention that Tim brought up an extremely great point, and that is the future of the workforce in the industry and how we wanna bring more diversity and inclusivity to our workforce and really um, work with underserved uh, um, students who are excited about STEM. So with that, um, I'm gonna introduce John Puzis, 
and he's going to uh, um, inform us about the more details on the Soderstrom Scholars Fund. Um, so Dr. Puzis is the Executive Director of Business Development at Yale University Office of Cooperation Research, where he leads a team of professionals who are responsible for the commercialization of technologies developed at Yale, including the spin out of new ventures to commercialize these technologies. He has been a member of OCR since 2001 and is on the board of directors at Renetics Inc., MindNest Health, and MindNest Health. Prior to joining Yale, he was an associate in business development and marketing at Proteome Inc. and a senior research investigator in anti-infective drug discovery at Bristol Myers Squibb. Please join me in welcoming John Puzis. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Don. Um, I'd like to start with a, a few words about my, uh, my experience with John uh, going back over 20 years now. Uh, so in 2001, I was leaving yes. Rhodium and um, I uh, interviewed with, uh, with OCR and I experienced- uh, Yeah, uh, sure, please. Uh, Don, you might want to mute, thanks. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I, I, at that point I interviewed with OCR and I experienced uh, John's uh, pressure interview style firsthand. And uh, after that, I thought uh, for sure that I had blown it, but lo and behold, John decided to hire me and I've been at Yale uh, close to 21 years now. Um, a lot, we've had a great run along the way. Uh, John has not only been my boss, but also an incredible mentor. Uh, it wasn't always easy. Uh, we, we shared a number of ups and downs. There was uh, certainly some yelling. Uh, there was also a lot of laughter and, a, and, and some triumphs uh, along the way um, uh, with John and the whole OCR team. Uh, so I wanna thank you, John, from the bottom of my heart for your mentorship, your guidance, and your friendship. Uh, as a way of honoring you and your career, I'm pleased to announce the launch of the Soderstrom Scholars Fund. This will provide uh, college scholarship funds for underprivileged Connecticut high school students who are interested in STEM careers, uh, and this will allow them to attend college in Connecticut. It will also connect these scholars to experienced mentors in the Connecticut bioscience community. Uh, the fund's initially going to be under the auspices of BioCT. Uh, Wigan and Dana is helping us to establish a framework for the fund. Uh, the board of directors will include David Shear, myself, and John Soderstrom. Uh, thus far, we've raised $104,000 thanks to the efforts of David Shear. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Blavatnik Family Foundation, Arvinus, Biohaven, Win Stanley Enterprises, Kevin Rakin on behalf of High Cape Capital, Tim Shannon on behalf of Canaan Partners, Pfizer, Wigan and Dana, Ed Cronin on behalf of Aon, Rally Bio, Elm Street Ventures, Connecticut Innovations, David Shear, Craig Cruz, and Beringer Engelheim. And so without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our man of the hour, John Soderstrom. So, um, wow. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a part of me that starts off by asking the question, who in the heck is this person these people are talking about? Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's really hard to recognize, but um, there are a few things I wanna say. First of all, um, being at Yale has truly been one of the um, most amazing opportunities that one could ever enjoy. Um, first of all, Look around, um, you know. Look at the talent um, that that you can assemble in a place like this. Um, I've been blessed beyond belief in terms of the team. You know, people like John Pusis, Jim Boyle, uh, Tim Obstra, Bill Weisler, Maura Grassi. I mean, I go on and on. And, and there have been, you know, many, many more over the years that you know have gone on to bigger and better things, like John Swartley. Um, it, it's hard not to achieve when you've got a team like that that's that's doing things, but probably um, it, it, at least as important is just having the kind of people in the community who um, want to make these things work. Um, you know, John Houston doesn't need me to be successful. 
John Houston is gonna be is gonna be great no matter what he does. Um, I was blessed that I got to actually work with the guy and see what he could actually do. Um, it, it's pretty freaking incredible, but I've seen that over and over again um, with different companies. Um, you know, it, it's it's really been a spectacular ride. Um, I think Tim Shannon and I, you know, probably hit it off because we're both kind of, um, I don't know, small town uh, type guys, even though I come from a whole lot smaller town than Tim did. Um, and I keep reminding myself that I'm this kid that grew up in Sparta, Michigan. You know, it's a little farm town north of Grand Rapids that nobody's ever heard of. And yet I could end up at a place like Yale for 25 plus years. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a remarkable ride. And when God gives you the opportunity to do something like that, you just don't want to screw it up. You just, you know, you want to make it work. And if I, if I did anything, it was, I was running scared half the time that people would find out that I'm actually a phony, um, that I actually couldn't do any of these things, but I could talk really fast and convince people like Carter Wynn Stanley that it might actually work, but it wasn't going to work unless I got all these other people to do the same thing. Um, and so I, I really truly do appreciate the fact that, that I have been surrounded by some pretty remarkable human beings who, you know, who actually believed that this was a real thing that, that we could do and we could do it together. And I've never seen myself as anybody other than kind of a supporting cast cheerleader, or whatever, um, in that whole endeavor. But it, it's funny, um, in a sense, because I've grown so much over the, the years I've been here. Um, I hope I've grown in good ways. I hope I've grown in ways that are, are, are better and more positive um, because it is true that, that, you know, when I first showed up 20 some odd years ago, um, I might not have been the most polished human being on the face of the earth. Um, and certainly people like Amanda and David and others um, remember some of that. But I, I actually, I count it as, as probably one of my great personal successes that um, David in particular, who, you know, anybody who had been around us 20 years ago or whatever would have said, wow, um, do those guys actually, you know, can they actually be in the same room by themselves without parental supervision? Um, would grow to be actually really good friends. Um, I count that as, a, as one of the great blessings of my life. Um, David, uh, it was a spiritual conversation. Thank you very much. Um, but I, I feel compelled in some respects to apologize to all those people that I probably ran roughshod over, um, that I may have treated with lack of of respect or not given a full weight to things. Um, and, and I'm truly, those I feel bad about because I remember them all um, and I don't remember them fondly. I am, you know, I am truly, um, I am truly blessed to have this event, um, to have people say these kinds of things because actually in the back of my mind, I know who I am and I, I remember a lot of the things I did wrong along the way. Um, and probably we succeeded in spite of, of that. But it's been, it's been a ride. It's been, it's been an amazing ride. And, and I have you know, made so many friends along the way, um, professional colleagues, sure. But I actually count most all of the people that, that um, are as actually friends, people that, you know, um, I wanted to know about their family life. I wanted to know, you know, where we could do things. Um, John Swartley, I probably didn't always practice what I preached as well as I should. So to my own family, um, you know, I kind of have to apologize to them to not giving them, you know, the full weight of my attention. Um, and, and that, I'm sorry, that's, that's getting really personal. But, you know, there have been some times when, you know, people would question, was work more important than family? And um, in all honesty, I probably put work first and that was not right. Um, but I have been 
blessed with a family that has been supporting me all the way along. Um, I must have been doing something right because my daughter Carrie is working at Biohaven, and before that was in our Venice. So, you know, that apple didn't fall too far from the tree. And, you know, in in all, you know, confession is that you know a lot of the stuff in terms of building the economy of New Haven was so that my kids would have a job in this area, so that I could be close to my grandkids, and that worked. Um, but I also, you know, the, even the ones that um, are in different parts of the country, my son, Luke, in, in Holland, Michigan, and, and my daughter, Rochelle, who, by the way, just made partner at Sibley Austin. I got to give her a shout out on that. Um, you know, have been a blessing to my life in ways that that uh, that I don't understand. But but my wife, Gail, has been the backbone of this whole thing. She's the one that kept it all together for me so I could do these things. And um, I say that in all love and respect. Um, I can't think of anything that would be more fitting than the idea of creating the scholarship um, for students, uh, um, local students that um, want to get a STEM career. Tim and I have talked about that for years, that we want to see more kids from New Haven get engaged in this business so that it will actually become part of the DNA of New Haven is that we not only create opportunities, we actually build them in, you know, from the inside out with, and populate them with, with New Haven people. This is truly a great opportunity that we have to, to try to do something like this. Um, I really thank the generosity of all the people who have, you know, donated money to this cause. Um, the one thing I will commit to you is it will be successful. We will make it successful. It will have an impact on the community. And um, it's not just because my name is associated with it, but it's that important because um, we need this to grow as, a, as, a, um, as a, a community that we can all look at um, and admire and respect what we've accomplished here. Um, I appreciate the fact that people um, you know, are saying kind things about me, but no, again, none of this happens without you. Um, and all I was is I was just, I hope, a good cheerleader. Um, so um, I, I'm I'm overwhelmed, to be honest. I, I as David knows, I don't um, I don't do these kinds of things well um, because I I don't know. I I don't like being the center of attention all that much, um, which is kind of weird for the job I was in but uh, it is just who I am as a person. And, but I do appreciate it and know that I would much prefer to be there with you in person. Um, but I thank you for all the, um, all the kind words that you've said about me and know that um, I will try to live the rest of my life to try to live up to earning them because I'm not sure I've done that yet. But, um, Thank you very much, uh, Don, and for all the people who were part of this today. Um, it's it's certainly very much appreciated. Um, and Joe Allen, wherever you are, I just want you to know that I did get the award, but it doesn't show up very well with my background. So I apologize for that. Um, but it's a beautiful piece and uh, I will display it with, with great pride on my bookshelf. And with that, I'm going to shut up and let this thing end early, I hope. <laughs> well, please don't everybody run away yet. But John, I just wanted to, on a personal note, um, when I first came into this position, I was new to Connecticut and really needing to try to get a feel of what's going on here. What's the ecosystem? Who is everybody? And I remember my first meeting with you. And we were sitting in your office and we were having a conversation and I didn't find it very warm and fuzzy. Um, and it was a little more like, okay, what's happening here? And who is this guy? Um, and I, I wanna say that because over the years I've watched you, I've seen the effect that you have had on the, on the industry, the people that you have worked so closely with and um, I just want to say that that I have come to truly respect you, John. 
And um, I thank you for the support you've given to BioCT. And um, I just wanna thank you. So Don, you're one of the people I was apologizing to. So uh, I, because I never meant to be anything other than supportive. You, you muted again, Don. John, I just want to say, um, no worries. I'll take you up on dinner and drinks. So thank you. Um, so with that, and again, this, this has been lovely. And for the folks that are still here with us, I wanted to take a few moments because normally during the uh, BioCT holiday, holiday celebration, um, we mention or talk about the Entrepreneur of the Year. So that is something that's very important for us in the community and did not want to omit that this year. So we had many, many wonderful nominees. Um, thank you, everyone. And the award committee included Dormer Stephen from Shipman and Goodwin, um, Cindy Green from Connecticut Innovations, Mustafa Analu from Yukon, Usha Palai, consultant and advisor to Rex Development and an EDC in New Haven, and Rob Bettengol, um, Elm Street Ventures. So the Entrepreneur of the Year Award was established by BioCT and Shipman and Goodwin um, to showcase the accomplishments, like John, of uh, the community and pe the, um, people having um, impact beyond our borders also. So in 2021, we are very excited to announce our Entrepreneur of the Year is Jonathan Rothberg. I'm sure you've all heard that name somewhere. <laughs> um, Jonathan, um, or Dr. Rothberg, founded Couragen in 1991 while a graduate student at Yale. Um, in 2000, he founded 454 Life Sciences, which brought to market new um, methods for sequencing the genome. Dr. Rothberg went on to invent the semiconductor chip-based sequencing and to found such diverse companies as Ion Torrent, Clarify, Raindance Technologies, AI, QuantumSci, Hyperfine, Detect, and Butterfly Network. In 2021 alone, he took three of his companies public, Butterfly Network, the developer of the world's first ultrasound on a chip, QuantumSci, which expands the frontier of protein sequencing, and Hyperfine the creator of the world's first portable MRI. And that in itself blows my mind because I've had several MRIs myself on a, that, that's tremendous. Um, and also new this year, because it was a hard thing to, to uh, choose, we wanted to also recognize the um, folks that are, that are maybe newer, um, they're younger, they're establishing themselves and you know, we wanted to acknowledge exceptional startups at any age and experience an impact with life in the ecosystem here in Connecticut and beyond. So with that, our first rising Entrepreneur of the Year Award goes to Nicole Wagner, who is the president and CEO of Lamb Division. And they are, she, that is a Yukon-based startup company that is developing a protein-based artificial retina. Dr. Wagner successfully secured 8.75 million in funding to drive commercialization of the company's technology, led LAMP division at its pre-IND meeting under the FDA, with the FDA. And under Dr. Wagner's leadership, LAMP division forged a successful partnership with NASA and the International Space Station, becoming the first organization to perform layer by layer manufacturing experiments on the space station work that can establish a foundation for products that have direct clinical benefit. Talk about beyond. Um, Dr. Wagner is a resourceful leader who demonstrates exceptional grit, creativity, and who personifies generosity and passion. We will now share um, Dr. Rothberg and Dr. Wagner accepting their awards. It is a privilege to be recognized by BioCT as Entrepreneur of the Year, especially in Connecticut, a state that was the home of so many great inventors. I grew up in the shadow of Eli Whitney 
and I've always been motivated to help the life of someone I love. A few weeks ago, the Omicron variant was detected and deciphered on an ion torrent sequencing machine, a technology developed by the team right here in Connecticut. I am incredibly proud of the work we do at Fort Catalyzer, our biotechnology incubator headquartered in Guilford, Connecticut. Between AI therapeutics bringing life-saving drugs to underserved patients, to Butterfly Network's handheld ultrasound on a chip technology accompanying NASA astronauts into outer space, to detect launching the first scalable FDA authorized PCR quality at home COVID test, to Hyperfine's first of its kind mobile MRI bringing imaging to those that need it most, to Liminal Sciences inventing and dedicated to making safe brain monitoring as ubiquitous as heart monitoring, to Tezzerac creating a new branch of diagnostics combining the best of radiology and clinical chemistry, to Quantum SI inventing next generation protein sequencing, our follow up to the invention of fast DNA sequencing for which President Obama awarded me the National Medal of Technology. And most recently to Protein Engineering Inc, applying advances in AI and molecular biology to heal our planet. It has never been a better or more critical time to be an entrepreneur. We are facing global health and environmental challenges that need innovative, sustainable solutions. I am proud to be among all of you in the Connecticut life sciences community answering this call and I sincerely appreciate this award. Thank you. Thank you very much to BioCT, the award selection committee, and to Shipman and Goodwin for selecting me as the recipient for the 2021 Rising Entrepreneur of the Year Award. I'm truly honored and humbled to receive this award and to be recognized as a leader and innovator in the state of Connecticut. I also wanna take this opportunity to thank my colleagues at LAM Division for their hard work and dedication as we develop our protein-based artificial retina for patients blinded by end-stage retinal degenerative diseases like retinitis pigmentosa and macular degeneration. Their passion, dedication, and drive make my job an easy one as we continuously seek to create new frontiers and conduct groundbreaking research in the state of Connecticut. I wanna close by saying that the Lamb Division story is one that would not exist if it were not for the amazing faculty and talent at the University of Connecticut, which helped to found the company, as well as the financial backing and support from Connecticut Innovations and the mentorship and guidance from organizations like BioCT. As a University of Connecticut alumni and resident in Connecticut's quiet corner, I'm proud to be a representative for the incredible work that we have going on in the state of Connecticut and to be part of such a rich ecosystem as we continue to grow our company. Thank you again for this honor and congratulations again to all of the other nominees and awardees. So round, round of applause that nobody can hear, but uh, for, these, for these awardees, very, very well deserved. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed um, the uh, evening contributions, passions, and dedication in honoring John Soderstrom, Jonathan Rothberg, and Nicole Wagner. And we look forward to the ninth annual BioCT holiday event in person. And John, you need to come back for that so we can uh, celebrate you in person. Um, I just wanted to close and announce that the Yale Innovation Summit will be expanded to a two-day event in 2022. On May 17th, BioCT will be hosting our first life science state of the industry um, event, which will highlight our industry accomplishments, stats, speakers, and much more. The Yale Summit is May 18th, and next year will be new as well, an evening reception celebration at Temple Plaza. And it will be a celebration. It'll just be a party, party, party. Music, drinks, um, um, so please, it'll, it'll be great fun. Um, and then May 19th, we're going to be doing morning tours of some of the companies in New Haven, especially for those folks that come from out of state to come to the summit. 
So thank you very much for being here all this time. And um, we really appreciate everything that you do as well. And uh, be well and enjoy the holidays. Thank you.